Welcome to the Ecom 8020 podcast, the show for brands looking to compete and win at selling online by building better customer relationships. Hosted by Isaac Hyman and Yako Rosenberg, co founders of High Flyer Digital and marketing experts for seven, eight, and nine figure brands, we'll reveal, discuss, and demystify the secret strategies that the top 1% use to acquire, convert, and retain customers better. Our mission is to help level the playing field and help you build more profitable, predictable, and scalable revenue streams for your business. Let's get started. Welcome back to the Ecom 8020 podcast. We're here with another exciting episode. And today we got a special guest, Vadi Labaton. And uh, <laughs> he is the co founder of The Perfect Gene, which is a very cool gene company, online gene company. He's an angel investor, he's the former head of growth at Kidbox. And after years of working in finance, he has experience in working with startup companies in e-commerce as well as investing. And uh, he's consulted for many D2C companies over the years. Um, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining us. We're excited to have you. Same. Thank you, guys. Great. So um, how was it that you got started in retail, um, switching over from finance into the retail industry and specifically e-commerce moving online sure so um it really starts with the fact that i think in the end of the day i like technology i like code i like solving problems with technology um like i i studied religion and comparative religion in college and then ended up working on wall street somehow but it Same kind of I, I have a big piece money is someone's was. religion not mine, but God bless. <laughs> um, but the, yes, exactly. The Wall Street was kind of yucky because of that. Nothing, nothing bad. It was a fascinating experience. But um, I kind of, in college, I minored in finance and majored in comparative religion. So I kind of like to always work on both sides of my brain. One is kind of the the numbers and analytics, and kind of the the, the structuring and kind of building machines in that way. But in the second side is being creative and writing and thinking through problems and psychology. So Wall Street has all the analytics, deep, deep, really powerful analytics that you're really thinking hard about how do you model the world? Um, and how do you kind of translate a perspective on the world into a financial model and therefore into stock or bond or asset performance? Um, but it's missing the creativity side uh, in terms of like, how do you communicate? How do you write well? How do you sell? How do you interact with people? So um, Wall Street really grounded me in deep analytics and thinking about the world as a spreadsheet, but it was missing that other side. And so getting into, into e-commerce was kind of a natural extension because I knew I wanted to work with startups. I knew I wanted to work in technology. I knew I wanted to build things. And one of the best places to do that, one of the most interesting in my mind is e-commerce, simply because it's a really, really hard problem where you have to solve a lot, a lot of little problems, um, any, which, any of which can kind of really hamper your business. So I like that challenge. Um, at the time, I, I, uh, I, had a, I still have, there's still friends who, who had a web development agency. We partnered together to kind of, they would build the technology. I was kind of sourcing deals and kind of operating these businesses. And so we kind of, for a year or two, built a handful of businesses that we owned and operated and partnered with wholesalers. Um, and when that ended, we, I made a lot of mistakes in how we built that and how we structured it. Um, wasn't the best success, but we learned a lot and kind of what are the keys to making a e-commerce business successful? And that was early 2010. So it was still the time of Google ads, Facebook ads were just getting started. Um, Shopify wasn't nearly as developed or popular then. Um, and that was kind of the natural transition. I had a lot of the analytics and kind of core ways of thinking about how to build an e-com business financially. But the technology side and the creative side, that was what I was really excited to work on. Awesome. Awesome. What's what's fascinating, what's fascinating about what you're saying is that it seems like you've built a business up as majority of Silicon Valley tech startups are doing, which is test, learn, refine. You said you had a lot of mistakes, you made some errors, but that didn't stop you. It seems like you've still been successful. Yeah, uh, did a lot of stupid things. Um, <laughs> 
but any entrepreneur who didn't do a lot of stupid things either isn't taking risks or has so much money that they don't need to, they don't have to make, it doesn't matter. Um, but no, it was interesting because after that, that experience with the web developer, we, I moved to Kidbox, um, which was venture funded, a lot of capital, take losses, build a brand, raise money. Um, amazing, amazing experience, great people. But ultimately, in my view, the business model was problematic because we just needed way stronger core economics. We needed to move faster. It was complicated. Um, complicated can be a big winner, but it's also riskier. You have to do everything more and more right. Um, and one of the things that I did with The Perfect Gene was Zach, my co-founder, um, and I kind of just naturally thought about what were the hardest parts of Kidbox and our previous experience, the thing, what were the mistakes that we made? We didn't like sit down and make it, put on a piece of paper. Here's all the mistakes. Here's how to not make them. We just kind of in, in, instinctually realized here are the things we need to do. We need to simplify it. We need to make sure we don't have cash flow problems. We don't want to deal with investors would suck up three months a year, potentially. Um, nothing wrong with it. It's just it, three months a year for the founders and operators of the business is a lot of time to spend raising money versus creating money. Um, and so we built a business that was fairly simple. Um, I love the concept from Nassim Taleb called anti-fragile. And that just means that you're not dependent on any one risk factor. And if, so for the perfect gene, if sales are low or we're seeing poor Facebook results or advertising results, we can scale down. We have very low overhead. It's a very flexible business. Um, like the and gene. that's what we like about it. Like the jeans. Like the jeans. Jeans yes. are pretty flexible. <laughs> I, I, I check those out. For us. Yeah, I like that. My brother's a big fan of your jeans. I looked at those. He was, uh, I know. He was modeling them for me. And we really like your website too. Oh yeah. Um, so they're great for hockey players, guys with big size, big butts, bigger yeah. boots, or just if you want to wear something <laughs> a little tighter without it like scrunching you up everywhere. Right. That's that's it's uh, a great product. Everything comes down to having a great product, and that product, all yes. the credit goes to to Zach on that one. Great. So um, I guess that'll that'll transition into um, you know where we are right now, and in terms of. Of the situation, 2022, whatever happened in the last two years with COVID, um, you're basically building a business throughout this situation. And online has taken a complete change in direction. People are shopping online way more than they have in their pet in the past because for a while people weren't able to go out. So an e-commerce business is is critical, and and you've been able to really build up your you know your brand, the perfect gene, organically. You know, and even with, with some of your paid advertising we've seen, you're still building a community and building customers throughout that. So talk a little bit about how COVID kind of, you know, modified your business model and then, you know, how you're acquiring and, and keeping customers throughout, throughout the situation. Sure. So the business started January 1st, 2020. So it really was an infant by the time COVID hit. I would, I would modify what you say a little bit. I don't think COVID actually changed the game for e-commerce. It just accelerated it. Right. Um, same tools and tactics in the end of the day. Um, and some categories were huge winners. Some categories were horrible. If you were selling suits in the beginning of COVID, terrible business to be in. No one's going to the office. If you're selling joggers, you could have made bananas money success in six months. Yeah. Um, Leggings was so huge. it definitely ch huge, huge. Yeah. It, it shifted the categories that were very popular, and every and most people got a little bit of a boost, especially kind of by the time you're getting to last summer, things kind of had settled into at least a new shopping normal. Um, but at the end of the day, the major issue for e-commerce and COVID was supply chain. Can you get product? Can you price it reasonably? And we were relatively okay with that because we have kind of a built-in manufacturing and finance partner. So we're comfortable loading up on inventory and storing it. Not an ideal situation. We'd obviously rather flow it in as needed, but because we structured the business to be robust and not to have to worry too much about inventory, that proved out to be extremely valuable. Um, in terms of how we're capturing customers and retaining them, in the end of the day, 
the, when you're being a marketer, you're communicating with a person on the other side of the screen. Um, you don't have a chance to sell them in person, obviously, but there's still a human being on the other side of the screen. You still need to speak to them like they're a human being. What captures attention? Humor, things that are a bit aggressive, things that are a little bit out there, things that are different. Um, and that's what we always try to be. It kind of, it makes it way more fun because you're not just copying, here's best practices. You're creating. You have to really think hard about how do you sell a product? How do you display a product in a way that's so obvious, so fun, so real that it feels like they're, like we want our customers to feel like they're talking to Zach and I versus just a brand. So a lot of people talk about a brand identity. Okay, that's good for some people, but a brand identity is not a human identity. It's a brand. We want it to feel like it's coming from us. So that meant we don't always obsess over pixel perfect emails. We sort of sometimes want it to just feel like he or I just scribbled it out, sent an email out to 100,000 people. And we mix it up. Some of the stuff is more polished, some less. But in the end of the day, we want the copy. We want the imagery to feel real. We want it to feel fun. We want to make people laugh. Most importantly, we want it to feel personal. We want our customers to feel like there's a human being on the other side that actually cares about delivering on the value. So um, I had an experience with a, with a brand, a software company that's just horrible. I won't say the name. And it was very obvious to me that the leader, their leadership team just wanted money and they didn't care about delivering a great experience or a great product. And it was so horrible. I'll obviously never use them again. And I asked around a lot of growth marketers. I was like, what was your experience with this? And they're like, oh, it was terrible. Oh, it was terrible. And you're like, okay, great. So that's not the best way to grow. And they brag in their emails about how much money they raised in their valuation. So you could see what they're about. For us, we want it to be about making customers happy. We want the customers to participate and share why they're happy. That obviously creates a virtuous feedback cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about how you communicate and how to be a marketer, which really means how do you communicate your value propositions, bring customers in, not just to buy and disappear, but to really enjoy what you're doing and to give the feel that everyone's having a bit of fun kind of just makes life much easier versus look at how fashion forward our gene is. It's like, mm, okay, that's 300 other companies doing that. Let's do something different. Yeah. Get noticed, really, and deliver on the value proposition. Have a great product. For sure. For sure. Yeah, that. Uh, and what's, uh, first off, I love to comment. I hope it's not the same email provider you had some challenges with back in, at Kidbox that probably we had the same challenges. <laughs> Maybe we'd talk about a different technology provider. But no, uh, we're doing a lot of it. Um, we work with a company called Scalero now. Um, the idea really was we need creative. Like we want the creative to feel like it's coming from us. So we've kind of worked with a lot of different companies. We want very non-standard stuff. We need people who can make off-color jokes and just get it. Um, because with Clavio, a lot of the like operational and data aspects are fairly straightforward and easy, especially for something as simple as our store where we really only sell one two three products um, right, right. but yeah no it's uh it's very different gig than what we needed to do at kidbox which had all kinds of technical challenges a lot of data to fiddle through a lot of segmentation here it's much easier and that by the way that was intentional like we made this a simple business it'll never be as big Probably, you know, knock on wood, it's, this is not a business that's designed to be a billion dollar business. It's designed to be a very profitable, medium sized business. Nimble. Definitely. Yeah. Nimble. Yeah. Just, just going easy, like... nimble, low overhead, low risk. Yeah. And it's funny that also you, you were saying before that marketing is, it seems like a lot, and maybe it's good for your market. It seems like a lot like dating, you know, you <laughs> got to get to know someone and have fun with them, support them and tease them and, you know. Oh, it's great analogy. It's it's exactly like dating. You have to communicate why you should spend any time together, why it's worthwhile, what are you going to get out of it, what am I giving, um, and you have to be a good communicator to be a good marketer. And it's not just about analytics and data and technology and like test, test, test. You have to decide what you want to test. You're going to be way more successful if you're intentional about what you're trying to communicate. Yeah, and, and just just a quote. You need to have some game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically. Just, just to quote you from uh, from you know a couple of months ago when uh -oh. we spoke, 
um, in terms of communicating with your customers, you, you mentioned to us that you want to be the kind of company that the emails and, and the content and social posts that are coming out of your company are like somebody sitting in the corner writing an email or writing a social post, probably a little high and giggling to themselves because they're having fun with it, <laughs> that, which means that you're having fun with it and the customer and the client yeah. and the social, social members are, are having fun with it. So it, it's just, it's Why a not? different tone. Yeah. It's a different vibe. And, and we, we really appreciated your brand when we saw it the first time. Like, this is totally cool. Like we, we love this. We totally dig this. So, so yeah, kudos to you guys. You're You're, you're really killing it. Um, Hell yeah. Thank you. So, so just, you know, we'll talk a little numbers cause we like to talk a, a few numbers here and there. Um, sure. how do you get your one-time buyers into two-time buyers? How do you get somebody who's a, you know, they, they picked up the first pair of jeans and either they love it, they don't, they, 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 they pretty much love it because everybody does. Um, you know, cause 74% of people, you just answered the question. What's that? You, ju you just answered the question. People buy again for one reason and one reason only. It's because they like the product and the value. That's it. All the rest of the retention stuff is BS. No one's, you cannot convince someone to buy something a second time if they didn't like it the first time, period. So no amount of tactics, no amount of marketing or communication will convince someone to buy a product if they don't like it don't need it or the price was too high that's it like we like do nothing especially clever for retention i have never seen anyone do anything especially clever for retention that isn't related to did you like the product buy it again meaning just hey remember we exist and b here's a cheaper price like that's it once someone has the product you've done all you can and if you don't like the product, no one's buying it. The nice thing about jeans is that everyone needs more than one pair. Um, same with t-shirts, same with a lot of different pieces of clothes. So clothes is kind of like a consumable um, with a little bit of a longer time span. So once we, we know that once we get someone who A, likes the jeans, which is the vast majority of people, and B, finds their right size, they're going to buy it again because the price is decent. It's not the cheapest pair of jeans, but by no means the most expensive but most people get it and are like, oh, this is way better than what I have. So we don't have to do a lot of work to get them to buy again. Just send out a couple. The emails are basically reminders that we exist. Right. Yes, it's fun. They're comic. Like we could obviously turn people off by being like assholes or a bad brand or boring. But in the end of the day, no one's buying unless they really like the, the product. And like, that's it. No tricks, no nonsense. There is no such thing as a company that's successful with like a really horrible product, just for a long term, obviously. But. Yeah. It seems like you're, you're, you've excelled in meeting their expectations, exceeding their expectations on the product level. And that yep. naturally they just can't keep coming back. You know, they happen to be part mm -hmm. of a good tribe community. Yeah. They, they and, and it definitely helps that like we have the right tone. So they're willing to give it another shot. But at the end of the day, if they hated the jeans or the jean was like, this is the same exact thing as Levi's, but an extra 20 bucks, no one's coming back. Right. Those businesses who have mediocre, businesses that have mediocre products are the ones that, that A, had bigger hits on Facebook and B, have a hard time retaining customers. So all, all that like product design is key, period. And like, that's one of the reasons why Zach and I are partners is Zach has um, a business where they make denim for the past 25 years. So they know exactly how to make denim the right way, comfortable. And they had a theory that like, hey, this is a great product. We've sold some of it in other stores. Like we can do a D2C brand around this. Nice, nice, nice. Um, one of the things that we try to do with our customers and clients is, is talk about personalization. Do you do any personalization in your marketing in terms of like, reminding people that they bought this product in the past, they might be interested in this, or is it more just, you know, you've bought from us, here you go, buy again. The answer um, could be no. I mean, it just, you know. The, the reality is we do some, meaning we're, we're, we try to be relatively intelligent about our segments, 
but no, there's not, maybe not enough. We don't do tons of like, you bought black, so now you want to buy blue, or you bought a pair of white jeans, so now you're probably going to buy this. In the end of the day, and the reason we don't do that is, first of all, it's very, very, very hard to do properly. Um, doable, but very hard. A lot of analytics, like all the AI engines in the world don't really do it right. And in the end of the day, you're trying to predict what someone wants when that person probably can tell you in a tenth of a second what they want. So I think my theory here is, and again, part of it's because we don't have 200 different products. If we had 200 products, it becomes a harder problem. It becomes a much more important problem to tackle. We have basics and they're simple. So we just say like, let me make it very easy for you to pick. Mm -hmm. You bought a black pair of jeans, you need another pair. You probably know I want a dark blue or I want a light blue or I want a gray. Make it easy for them to just go, bam, pick it and you're good to go. Does it really matter if I put a picture of a gray pair of jeans? Yeah, I'm sure it's better, but um, so hard to achieve. Um, and we focus on like 80, 20, really 95, five. We want to put in the 5% of work that produces 95% of the results. Getting the rest of the way is really a grind. It's not so fun. Some people love it. We don't. Um, but yeah, over time we'll have to get better and better at that, but I don't know how necessary it is early on. We, it's we more just it. make it easy for someone to choose to surface what they want. Right. We, we love it when, uh, when our guests plug our podcast, you know, we are the 80, 20 podcast. So, uh, you hit <laughs> it right yeah. on the head. Oh, I didn't even realize that. That's awesome. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so well done. Thank you so much for that plug. Um, you know, just let's focus on that for a second because, you know, I was looking up, we're doing some research before this. And, uh, you know, I found a bio for you on the org.com. And, uh, one of the things oh, that you wrote so that you wrote, what motivates you is, uh, building machines and then watching them function without me. So I can do other things, right. That yeah. is the idea behind the 80, 20, right. The 80, 20 rule is you wanted to do 20% of work to get 80% of your revenue, 20% of your efforts to get you 80% of your results. And that's really where, you know, a lot of businesses are having challenges because they're trying to do too much and it doesn't always work, work out. Yes. So, so talk about what you've yes. done, you know, specifically in this brand, but other brands and in even other companies that you worked in in the past of how you work smarter and not harder so that we can, you know, help our audience and help, help everybody listening. Um, one, we hired the best, if not one of the best media buying and creative teams and made them kind of close partners. That's thesis testing. They're, they're our Facebook and paid media agency. Um, that is what takes the most work in e-commerce is advertising for the most part. Um, so we made them, we, we, we picked the best and got very close with them and we make sure that we're easy to work with and they want to work with us and we're not a pain in the ass and we're not yelling and screaming like, we want them to know that we get it and we appreciate what they do. And we want them to know that we're watching and we get what they do and that we appreciate them. So kind of a two-way street. Two, um, we say no to a lot of things, uh, meaning everyone has, there, there's a whole ecosystem of little apps that claim they're going to boost your ROI and do this and do that. And the reality is most of them don't work. They take a lot of time and you know, we worked with something that was producing 1% of our sales and I'll take 1% of the sales if it's easy, but it was starting to become work. And at that point, it's like, it's taking time away from doing creative testing and media buying. That's like, has real scale. If you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on Facebook, you should be investing your time there, not on some little app that's producing 1% of sales. And it's really cute. And it, they're, oh, it has a 300 X ROI. Cool. 300 X on a thousand dollars. Isn't like, well, it's not that that is a lot, but like 20 X on a thousand dollars doesn't really move the needle. Um, and it's not real numbers. So you really have to say no to a lot of things. You have to avoid anything that's a wrench that's going to mess up your ecosystem and like create complexity for buyers. People sort of think that buyers want lots and lots of options and tools and fiddle around. And like, we don't do a loyalty program. Uh, maybe it works well. Maybe it doesn't. I don't really know. I've never seen anything amazing about it. It sounds great but it actually creates a lot of complexity for a brand to manage and for customers to deal with. How many points do I have? Like, it's great if you're Kohl's or Amazon or Lowe's and you're big brands and people are shopping repeatedly. But for us, people just need to buy a pair of jeans every whatever, 30 days, 90 days, 180 days. Just make it easy for them. Give them a coupon. 
so much easier than I have points. It's in my thing. It's a friction point. It's an anxiety point. So it's like, keep things simple. Um, say no to a lot of stuff. Be very suspicious about anyone who's making big, broad claims about what they're going to do. I can't tell you how many people, how many emails a day, one to two emails a day from email marketing agencies who are telling us how they get 300 X ROIs on this and this. And I was like, okay, like you obviously don't know what you're doing because you're, you're, you're sending me a marketing message. That's not believable. So like keep things simple, be real and try to really focus on the stuff that is core to your customer, not for core to you. And that's one of the biggest, I'd say lodestones that if you stay close to it and you don't really, and, and you stay close to that, what makes your customer's life easier what saves them time, what saves them money, then you're in really good shape. If you start diverting yourself into all these other things of, oh, I need to do this app and that app and all that stuff, you're going to get in trouble. And we also, I'd say the, the other side of that is we overpay for services that are good because they just work. And I think that's a very important concept that when like, we don't have the cheapest warehouse and fulfillment, but it works. We work with a warehouse called Mason Hub. Um, sure, it's not perfect, but it's as good of warehouses I've ever worked with. And we pay them a lot and they do a great job. And that takes a lot of time off of our hands so that we can work on marketing and creative, which is your, which is your 95% of driving your business forward. Nice. It nice. seems like it's, what's fascinating is, is one of the biggest call-outs was shiny new object syndrome is a major killer for a lot of brands. They all yeah. chase after this next big thing and they, they leave majority of that the capabilities on the table from their existing object. Yeah. So. Over optimizing the wrong yeah. things takes up a lot of entrepreneur time. Um, how many different types of pop-ups can you fiddle with and referral programs and this and in the day, none of that's core. Like you need to get your core engine working. You need to get a product that people love and you need to be able to communicate why they should love it and buy it. Right. And sometimes that com that's communicating to the clients and sometimes it's the, the, the customer and sometimes it's the customer communicating it back to you. And you might have an idea that like this gene is going to be your core product. And then they might turn around and say, you know what, we want something else because that's where all the traffic is going. That's where all the, uh, all the, sh all the sales are going. So, exactly. um, so, you know, specifically with, with the perfect gene, where do you see your business going in the next six to eight months? And then, you know, e-commerce in general, you know, where, where would you see that? that going? Um, big question. I think six to eight months, I think like we actually have planned out pretty well. Let's get inventory and sell it, expand our product line and continue to build out like our creative operations, which just means more and more concepts, more and more videos, more and more things to test. Um, I don't see anything like the, how many it's, it's kind of like a, little industry of people making prognostications about where e-commerce is going conversational commerce ai influencer marketing i don't yeah. i don't see any of that influencer whatever there's right. a thousand things in the end of the day facebook ads which is if you really think about facebook ads it's the same as a tv ad just shorter for the most part like mm -hmm. you're just grabbing attention where people are watching in some ways it's obviously it's a technological leap but it's very similar to what it was and then communicating with customers emailing them but maybe direct mail like the core of it is simple and the same um the one thing that i think i would say is um, analytics have become way more complicated post facebook ios because you can't rely that much on facebook or google analytics um so it's forced us to really think way harder about how we measure things. Um, we are working with a company called Northbeam. I'm happy to plug them. Um, they're awesome. They've given us a, um, a big, a, an alternate way of looking at a lot of our analytics. That's a new source of truth. So there's no one thing that we look at anymore as like, this is correct. It's not Facebook. It's not Google. It's not Google analytics. It's not Northbeam. It's not Shopify. We look at everything together and we look at it from three or four different lenses and that tells us where the, where truth probably is. So when there are overlaps in all four platforms, that's when we know we probably have something right. But that's, that's probably the biggest change that a lot of brands are going to struggle with is 
how do you, given the reduced efficiency of Facebook and Instagram and the reduced um, fidelity of their analytics, how do you get better and more points of view so that you can really understand what you're marketing it is? And how do you deal with the inherent fuzziness of all this? It's just not precise anymore. And how do you manage that? And so for us, we there's no single source of truth and you have to accept that. And you have to have three sources that are 80% true and figure out what do you do with the, the 20% fuzziness. I think that's huge. And the reality is, is always remembering that if your creative is awesome, your targeting is less important because you're convincing a wider array of people to buy or to get brand awareness. So that's really how we think about the world is just pay for better analytics than another point of view and continue to focus on creative because if you can convince someone who Facebook didn't think is like immediately in market for jeans to buy a pair of jeans because your creative is awesome and you've captured attention over time, that snowball builds very fast. Nice. Nice. Yeah. That's one of our core core pillars here at, uh, at high flyers is, is the data, right? The data tells us what, what's going to, what's going to move the needle. You might have an opinion and we'll have an opinion, but the data is going to, going to make the decision for us. So, uh, you know, we, exactly. we definitely appreciate that. And we see that with, with lots of e-commerce businesses, and um, yeah, any any uh, any closing points, Isaac? Uh, no, I think this is great. I think you're just learning from you as an e-commerce brand owner who's done it multiple times, right? You're a serial kind of entrepreneur, serial uh. e-commerce guy, you know, for, for lack of, you know, failings and successes, no matter what, you just know the value of constantly iterating, constantly uh, moving in line with your customer, meeting your customer where they're at, and just having a great product. Right. So I think that's really that's what it comes down to. Yeah. So the product really is everything. Yeah. Really great to have you here and just kind of talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Hell yeah, guys. Um, I appreciate it. This was fun. This was fun. This was so much fun. So uh, this has been an, a great episode of the Ecom 8020 podcast with our guest, Ovadia Labaton. And thanks so much yeah, for listening. Yeah. Have a great week, everybody. <laughs> thanks, guys. guys. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Ecom 8020 podcast. If you enjoyed this show, please make sure to subscribe and follow us on social at High Flyer Digital for daily tips, content, and videos. To put this week's strategy into action and move your brand forward, go to highflyerdigital.com slash book and schedule a free 15-minute chat with Isaac and Yako. Let's partner together to compete and win at e-commerce. Your brand is worth it. Until next week, this is Isaac and Yako wishing you a successful and profitable week.